I'm on. Oh yeah. Seven hundred miles to come to it. Stud in the box. You're listening to the Point Click Fish Podcast. We bring you the best in fishing entertainment with interviews, how-tos, stories, food, fishing reports from the captains, teens, and celebrities that are all in the industry. And now, here's your host, Captain Jay Feimster and the Point Click Fish team. Hey guys, we're back for another Point Click Fish Fishing Podcast radio episode. Price, we're excited to be back. Got a great show planned this week and uh, looking forward to bringing one of our good friends back on the show. Oh, absolutely, man. The, the podcast has been so much fun to do. Uh, we've done several now, and I mean, check them out, pointclickfish.com. And uh, Jay, also, I want to remind our listeners, uh, make sure to sign up for the Point Click Fish uh, newsletter. We've got some great articles, how-tos. Obviously, we'll have the podcast on there as well. So make sure to go to the website, pointclickfish.com, and sign up for the newsletter because you'll find out some great information that you're hearing from these caps. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of good information, a lot of new articles, a lot of great content rolling out on the newsletter, and even some giveaways coming up. So that's something that's uh, really exciting for us. I'd say a price this time of year on the North Carolina coast, it's one thing. Um, really, it kind of kicks things off for us with our fishery here is we always start to see the Spanish mackerel arrive, and then we always start to see the Kobe arrive. And so this is a question that we get a lot from our audience, both on the website and social media, is how do we target, how do we catch, what do we use when we're fishing for cobia and Spanish mackerel? Obviously, as our listeners know, we live on the coast of Moorhead City. We get the opportunity to work with a lot of great captains. Our friend and captain Noah Link from Noah's Ark Charters is back on the show with us from Harker's Island, North Carolina. Noah? Welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, how you guys doing? We're doing fantastic, man. You know, we're talking a little bit here before we got on the show and catching up. And, you know, everybody's kind of getting the the list knocked off while we can finally get back on the water and get back to action. That's something we've all looked forward to. How are things been going for you the past couple months, Noah? Well, the past couple months, it's been a it's been a pretty windy spring, but we have here lately had a few good weekends with some really good fishing, and um, you know the the bluefish showed up early, and then we've had a good bonita bite, the Atlantic bonita, which is a tuna, and the Spanish mackerel bite has been phenomenal, and they've been really good size this year. You know that's that's kind of the progression of things for us here on the uh, on the North Carolina coast as we start to see these species roll in and it really kind of kicks the fishery off in full drive and uh, I've had the opportunity to get out with my boys um, to catch some of the Spanish mackerel and they've really been really good sizes this year I've, I've been impressed. Yeah, they've uh, they've been really nice size in the in the upper twenties to close to thirty inches for the big ones and there's been plenty of them. And uh, it's been in a windy spring, hard to pick a perfect day to get out. But like I said, we've had about three really good weekends in a row, and uh, it's allowed a lot of people to kind of get out a little bit and get on the water, catch some nice fish. So hopefully the the rest will come soon. Well, that's what it's looking like. Now, one of the things – that, uh, that we had talked about is a lot of people ask a lot of questions. Um, and, you know, we'll start with the Spanish mackerel fishing 101. So talk to us a little bit about when you're preparing to go Spanish mackerel fishing, what, ro- what rods are you getting, what line are you using, what leader are you using? I mean, those are the questions that a lot of people ask. And, and you know, of course, what are those go-to lures uh, when you're Spanish mackerel f- fishing, whether you're casting to them or trolling for them, what are your go- what's your go-to setup? Well, Jay, what I use is uh, I'm going to use for trolling, start with trolling, and uh, I use the uh, the Clark Spoon Topwater. There's a new Topwater rig that's come out. We tested it for a while, and um, it's on the market now. It's called a mini teaser, and um, it's basically a Topwater trolling 
Rig. It's got the, it looks just like a, a tuna teaser, but it's just real miniature and it's trailed by Clarkstone. And um, I do that for my one on each side for that. And then I'm going to do two hand lines with a number two planer on my uh, the paracord that you attach to the boat. I'm going to run about 25 feet of that and then about 25 feet of mono or fluorocarbon off the back that attaches to the spoon and i'm gonna you know i like the, the spoons i'm i'm using the silver with pink flash white with pink flash or silver with blue and white with blue those are if you look all over from near shore to offshore those are very popular colors to fish with and um now and then when I'm trolling for Spanish, I'm going to do about six to six and a half knots. Mm -hmm. It is my experience throughout the years that as you slow down or if you've got a throttle that creeps back on you a little bit and don't really notice it, you'll start catching bluefish. And that's all you'll catch. You won't catch the Spanish because they wanted a certain speed. And that kind of leads me into, you know, if you're catching them trolling and you hit going in a a circle pattern and you, you you're right on a school i usually just stop i have rods rigged up for casting and i always remind people that you know we were just trolling six knots these fish want it fast so when you're casting to them you've got to be a quick reeler and not everybody can do that but because you got to reel it fast i've seen <clears throat> i've seen the fish follow a bait right to the boat and turn off just because it's not fast enough not it's not getting away from them like a, a normal food fish would do for them but what i'm using for casting um start out with the uh the gotchas the the good old gotcha plug is hard to beat that's a good one mm -hmm. comes in a lot of different sizes some has but some have bucktails coming off the the back of them um, also, the gotcha jig fish in the half ounce, that's a really good, it's a. It's just a metal bait. I like it in the black and silver, blue and silver, and pink and silver. Mm -hmm. And then we got Sea Striker Surf Spoon. It, it's uh, a really good bait. It comes in silver or gold. And uh it's similar to a cast master, but it's a, that's also a good bait. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, moving on to the, to the Clark spoon jigs. I'm sure there's still some people that don't realize that Clark spoon has a whole line of casting jigs out right now. And they're really good. Um, the ones that I really like for the Spanish are the pogey jig in a uh, three quarter ounce. It works real good. These, these are metal jigs, and you can these metal jigs. You can cast them a long way, so you don't have to get right on the school. You see them popping, jumping, or you're catching them in an area, or maybe you find them where the birds are working. But you don't have to. You just ease up a little, you know, about twenty yards away, and you can make an easy cast mm -hmm. with these. But uh, that pogey jig and the Clark spoon stick jig that comes in the it's got a holographic side on it. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one as well. But um, and I, that's about all I'm going to use for casting because you could go on and on with different stuff. But I, I've got those. I know they work, and I, I stick with them. Now, when you're um, when, when you're casting, Noah, um, what about your your fluorocarbon leader? What do, what are you using then? On the fluorocarbon leader, I use an all P line fluorocarbon. It's really good. Um, they're, they're, they use the Japanese fluorocarbon where their factories are made, and um, it's, it's a softer fluorocarbon than your traditional or your traditional fluorocarbons, which is, by nature, fluorocarbon is stiff. And a lot of times, it won't, if your, your cheaper fluorocarbons won't tie a knot good. It might look good. But it will, it's so stiff in nature that it will untie itself, you know, in 10 or 15 minutes. And 
I, you know, a lot of times when you lose a fanish or a nice fish, you think that you've been cut off, and there's nothing worse than coming in and seeing the little knot at the end of the line where it untied. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, I, I particularly don't like that because it's my fault being the guide and captain. Um, so, yeah, I use all P line full carbon. It's uh, it's really good stuff. What pound uh, do you do you suggest? I'm using thirty pound. Okay, for that. Yep. Now you brought you brought up a good point. You know, when you're trolling, is obviously you know you said six six and a half. You know, a lot of people right. that that's kind of uh, the misconception. They they think they're either going too slow or they're going too fast, and so that's really good advice. To you know, some people may think that's too fast, but like you said, the Spanish mackerel they they like it fast. I mean, that's what they want. And so a lot of people, you know, they're trolling three three or four knots, you know, almost like they're king mackerel fishing, and they're just, Spanish don't want it. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. They uh, they just won't hit it, or they'll follow it, and they'll look at it, and they won't, they won't touch it. They'll turn away from it. And you can be, you can be going slow, even five knots, and not catching them, and know they're there, and bump your throttle up. And almost instantly get a fish. Now let's say something. Now let's say real quick, knowing like if if you get a hit, you reel it in. What do you suggest people do at that point? Keep going, circle back around. What what's what's the yeah. advice? What I do is hit uh, a vent marker or man overboard on my GPS, and that marks it right there. If I I usually catch about three fish before I'm going to say, okay, they're here. Mm-hmm. You know, make or make about three passes. So, you know, I got four lines out, but let's say I make three passes through that area. And if I'm, you know, you're going to know it, you're going to get two to three, maybe four lines go off all at once, you know, and you're, you know, you're there. So, yeah. and one other, one other lure that is pretty universal trolling and casting is one that I really like is the Yuzuri lures. In the uh, about three and a half to about four and three eighths that they make, and you control those. And if you start catching, you just reel it in, start casting, stop, reel it in, start casting on them. You don't have to even switch rods. It's, it's uh, and for some reason, there's plenty of shallow diving lures out there, but they love those Yuzuris. Something, something about the way they swim. But that's a that's a real good uh, bait to try. Now, what's some of the things that you see that, uh, let, let's say, mistakes that people make? Um, you know, whether some things that they should or, or shouldn't do that you see people uh, where they make mistakes by Spanish fishing? Well, the biggest mistake that I see people make is most people come down and they're going to go Spanish fishing. They're going to get their their rods out with their rod planers and clock spoons. And there are days when they don't bite those. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not catching any Spanish on this. They're not, they're not here. They're not biting. And that's why I use the assortment of casting lures and different trolling methods. So on top, you know, I put two on top, two on the bottom, or two down in the water column. So I'm covering both, and usually one or the other catches better, and you can pretty much pull pull in the hand lines or pull in the rod. Now, so, no, now, Noah, let's say we've got, you know, somebody inland never fished before. They just bought a boat. They've, you know, they bought the equipment that you that you said. They put the boat in the water. Where do they go? I mean, what what are they looking for? What what are they doing? Well, when you go out, um, like I, I tell people in my seminars, two, two things to look for right away. Birds and other boats fishing for what you're fishing for. And usually in this area here, around Atlantic Beach, Shackleford Cape Lookout, um, you're going to see people trolling out near the jetty 
area there, you're going to see them trolling down Shackleford along, you know, about 100 or so yards off the beach. Maybe a little further, you know, on bumpy days, but you don't want to get too close to shore. And, um, you know, around the Beaufort Inlet, down the Atlantic Beach area, mm-hmm. it's going to be a good spot for them as well. So that's, uh, you're not going to see people fishing for Spanish too far offshore. Mm-hmm. Not that they don't get out there. They do, but a lot of people, they feel more comfortable staying with inside of land, you know, fairly close. So there's nothing wrong with that. But that, those are the areas you're going to want to look to catch Spanish. Mm-hmm. There's always the, the all-ball spot that you might catch some in. But um, And something to think about for people, too, is you don't want to troll where there's a lot of traffic, you know, if uh, if you're not used to doing that, you know, kind of either watch the direction that everybody's kind of going in. Most everybody will get in a pattern if they're all in the same area. So you don't want to go against the grain there. And, um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, choose somewhere that's uh, not as crowded. Because Spanish, they get all over up and down the beaches here, so... A lot of people, they go out Spanish fishing, and they're going to find, they're going to see two boats, and they're catching some fish, so they're going to stay with those. And then, you know, it just piles on. People see somebody catching fish, they stop. And they don't, you know, they don't go look much further. I tend to stay out of those, you know, where it's crowded. I just, uh, I don't like working up working four lines in a crowd of boats but well, uh, well you know another thing a good point that you brought up too is um you know one if you're let, let's say you're a novice you're you're just not real sure about fishing this way and you get in a crowd then one you are, may get too close or you may get your lines tangled up with the other boat because that does happen quite a bit so if you're not real right. sure what you're doing and you don't get in the the pattern, if you will, and you like you said, you go against it, there's a good chance you're going to get caught up, tangled up, and um, somebody's not going to be happy. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happens. And there's always somebody that gets upset. You know, I've had my lines cut plenty of times, but it happens. You know, you just got to. You just gotta suck it up and take it, but uh, <laughs> or stay out of it, right? <laughs> yeah, you know that's that's what I do. I stay out of it, and I go searching in places that I've caught fish before. But in that respect, I've been out in this area doing it for a long time, and I know areas that uh, some people are uh, how do you say nervous about getting into um, crossing the shoals, the Cape Lookout shoals those types of things but um yeah just you know you don't have to get right in the mix with people if you're uh you know feeling a little bit skittish about getting in there you know troll outside area go down shackleford it's usually plenty of room down shackleford it's a big area but when you get in to take lookout and you get over there by the rock jetty or even a little further out there's going to be a lot of boats and most people are going to be trolling this time of the year, you're going to find people anchored up for cobia, and you got to go around them in some way. I mean, you, do, you really got to keep your eyes open and know what other boats are doing when you're when you're out in this area. You're fishing, especially with trolling. You got to you really got to keep your wits about you. Yeah, you you really do. And um, what generally what size reels do you recommend for trolling? Does it does it you have a preference? Well, I do. I don't use any uh, large rods with planers on them. I use no rod planers. So Mm -hmm. I'm going pretty much what people would consider light tackle. I'm using all-star rods. And for trolling, I'm going to use, if I want to get a trolling-type rod, I use all spinning reels. So I'm going to use from a 4,000 to a 4 to 5,000 series reel. And you can get away fine with uh, 15, 
to 20 pound braid but i'm probably going to be using about a 5000 series reel if i have my way about it and um i'm going to be using the uh one of the star rods in the uh 8 to 17 or 17 to 20 pound range it's a you know it's a pretty stiff rod and um, it'll handle most anything it'll even handle a cobia if you catch one trolling which a lot of people do this time of the year so well let's talk a little bit that's what i do well, i just i use all spinning reels and pretty much light tackle so obviously that's a great segue into cobia because while you're spanish fishing particularly here in north carolina in this area the chances are if you're out spanish fishing this week this weekend you know you're the, the, there's a good chance you're going to see a cobia what do you need to have what do you need to do to catch a cobia or specifically target cobia okay um you got two ways to fish for cobia you can fish on the bottom with a what we call here in eastern north carolina it's a slider rig and i'm using a uh I'm using a four ounce sinker. Really doesn't matter whether it's a a bank sinker or pyramid sinker. That doesn't really matter. Four ounces is, is pretty good. It'll stay on the bottom in the current. And um, I'm going to use probably a anywhere from a five to seven aught hook. Um, my preference for hooks, I use pretty much all mustad hooks. Um, you want to use good, strong hooks. You don't know. You might catch a 10-pounder or you might catch a, a 90-pounder. And uh, you need something with the with the big eyes that are going to it's gonna hold. You don't want to come up with a bent hook. But um, and, uh, coming from that sinker to the hook, I'm going to put probably uh, about an 80-pound leader. Some people use uh, fluorocarbon. Some use wire. But... Um, I've used both, and I'm going to put a, a swivel right at about five feet. I'm going to have that leader about five feet long, and I'm going to put a swivel there and then attach the the uh, other line to it so that when that, sink, when that sinker slides, when that sinker comes down the line, it'll hit that swivel and it won't end up on your bait. You're still going to have, you'll always have that five feet. But no telling, you know, when that sinker hits the bottom, it can, the sinker's on the bottom and your line can go out 10 or 15 feet because it, it, it slips through. So it works really good that way. Mm-hmm. And I usually run, I'm, I'm running, I'm fishing the bottom and I'm taking it seriously. I'm running five rods. I'm going to put two out the back and I'm going to put them short just a little ways from the boat and on the bottom then I'm going to run two more on the bottom on out the ways and there, that's four on the bottom two short two long and then I'm going to run what I call a center rigger with about a half an ounce of weight on it all the way out and it's going to ride just under the surface in case you got one coming through swims on top, which a lot of them do. And uh, what I would suggest using for bait, the best bait you can get around here, in my view, is fresh shad or menhaden. And um, if you if you if you got a live well and you can catch them, it's always great to keep. You know. I th- I think, 30 or 40 of them alive. I think you meant if they can throw a cat's net, right? <laughs> correct. correct. <laughs> so that's, the, that's the toughest part, isn't it, Noah? Some people uh, they have uh, a little, little hard time uh, learning the cat's net. I was getting there. <laughs> yeah, you know, if, if you can do the cat's net, you know, you know if, you're, if, if the situation is in the best of everything, the cat's net, a pile of shad, you put a bunch in a cooler, ice down, so you can keep them fresh and you keep some in your live well and 
but as long as they're fresh and they still got that slime on them is the important thing. And uh, that way, also, if you're going to be cobia fishing this time of the year, you need to, if you're serious about it and you really want to catch one, you need to go a lot during cobia season, which doesn't last very long here. But the guys that really put a hurt on them, they go every day for about three weeks while they're here and uh you know they catch fish but you can stock up on these men hayden like that you know you might not come across a school every day so when you do stock up on them mm-hmm. if you're not a cast net person and you just want some bait go to one of the local fish houses and buy a flat of, of men hayden they they freeze them but they don't keep it very long so it's pretty fresh when when it thaws out and that'll that'll work good as well you know, a lot of people do that. But um, one thing, when you're fishing around here on the bottom, or pretty much anywhere for that matter, I got to have my tide and wind going the same direction. It's hard to fish otherwise. When the tide changes, you got lines running under your boat, around it, and I mean, they're going to be tangled within a few minutes soon as the tide changes and gets rolling good so when that happens i usually pick up and uh we'll go sight fishing you know and that's an you know i got a tower in the boat which helps tremendously um and we'll go do that and that's a whole another ball game you're using casting plugs and um bucktails things like that and what I'm going to be uh, using those, I'm going to use a uh, a star rod, like medium heavy, and uh, with a about a 6,000, 7,000 series spin reel. And I'm going to be using bucktails in real nice colors. And one thing to, to, to know about Sovia is casting to them is the fact that they are very curious fish. They're not afraid of anything. They'll come right up to your boat, as a matter of fact. And I always have about, say, five rods rigged up, and I'm going to have something different on every one of them. Because you might cast something at one four or five times, and he'll turn on it, but he won't hit it. And you pick up another rod with something else on it, and boom, he hits it right away. But usually what I'm going to be throwing, sight fishing for Cobia, I'm going to use the, uh, these are top water baits because they, they work really good. And Cobia, a lot of people don't understand. It. Cobia, they're very aggressive and they're very curious. So they'll hit a lot of different stuff. But on my top water baits, I'm going to use the Savage Gear Panic Prey. It's a large top water bait. It's got really good hooks on it. It's meant, meant for big game. And, um, you know, to me, that's important. If you hook a big one, you don't want to have a lure that costs you 5 or $6 because a good chance he's going to bust the hooks or the rings or everything. And uh, the other one that I'm using is the Halco Rooster Popper. It's a, uh, it's a pop. It's a uh, top water, like a chugger bait, and um, throws a lot of water, but it really gets their attention good. I've caught several nice ones on both, and uh, those those probably that's my two primary top water baits. If I'm throwing like bucktails, I'm gonna have a few. These are big bucktails; they're probably an ounce to an ounce and a half, and uh, pretty good size. But a lot of your colors with your pinks and greens, oranges, yellows, things like that are going to work real good for your uh, for your bucktails. And a lot of people will use like a six to eight inch Do not curly call tail. It. You know, similar to what they, uh, they call a mojo rig for striper fishing. Mm-hmm. Put that curly tail right up inside the bucktail. And that works really good as well. And it's just you got to try a lot of different things with cobia when you're sight fishing. You never know what they're going to hit. Now I had, I caught a nice one one day off the shoals on uh, that Halco rooster popper, and 
there were some guys that came by that were really, really good cobia fishermen. They're out there all, every year. They're here. They follow the cobia from South Carolina on up. and They'd never seen one caught on a topwater plug. So, you know, you just got to try stuff. You never know what they're going to hit. Well, like you said, they're very curious fish, but uh, they can also be very picky as well. I mean, I've watched people throw different lures to them and they just don't want anything to do with it. Then finally you get that one it wants and it, it goes after it. Exactly. That reminds me of uh, one thing that I, that I haven't gone over is the fact that Tobia are very similar to what I say getting two children together or alone. I tracked one one day for an hour in about three feet of water. It was a big female, probably I think it was about 80 pounds. And uh, we threw everything in the world to her from, from artificial to menhaden and everything, and she wouldn't have anything to do with it. And right out of nowhere, about a 20-pound male came starting up to her, and she hit the next bait to hit the water because she didn't want him to have it. Just, like I say, it's just like two kids. The one doesn't want the toy until another one is involved. So if you can do that, that's, uh, that's, if you can find a, two or more together, you're more than likely going to catch one. It's like when you get a, a school of redfish. They're afraid the other one's going to get it, so they just they, they go after it even harder because they think they think the other one's going to get it. Exactly. It uh, They don't even have to be hungry. They just don't want that other one to have it. <laughs> and uh, one thing that I'll say, when uh, when you're sight fishing them and one takes it, have your drag set somewhat light so he can just go with it. He'll turn the other direction and go. Let him get it before you uh, try to set the hook. I have a lot of people that have missed really nice fish. They see him, you know, you can see him hit it, and they get excited and set the hook instantly. And a lot of times, Toby don't have it good. They'll put it in their mouth. They'll close it, but they're, they haven't swallowed it or done anything with it. It's just sitting there. So you don't want to pull it right out of their mouth. You want to let them have it. Well, that's another thing, too, that um, obviously – those of us that have been fortunate enough to uh, to get cobia and then get them in the boat, but you know everyone, uh, you know a green cobia is, is not not real fun once you get it in the boat. So talk to us a little bit about uh, you know fighting it and it running and and you know taking it a little too early um, that that could lead to a to a missed fish. Yeah, it can exactly and. Um also, you know, a green cobia, as a lot of people know, if you do gas them and you do get them in the boat, I tell everybody, even if I've got one that's worn out, everybody to one end or the other, whichever end that I'm putting the fish on, put them in the other because these cobia have been known to break people's legs, they tear up coolers, all kinds of stuff. And uh, you just let them beat out in the bottom of the boat for a, a minute or so and they, they're good to go then. But yeah, they got some real dangerous spines on them. But um, especially if kids on the boat, you want to make sure they're out of the way completely. Because once that boat, once that fish, that cobia gets in the deck of that boat, he's he's going. <laughs> exactly. It, like I said, they will self frack everything around. You know, I try to kind of if I get somebody that's got one, I'm going to keep them on the bow of the boat, and I'm going to. You know, I'm going to chase them. And this brings me to another thing. If you're going to uh, sight fishing, it's no problem chasing them. You're already moving. You don't have an anchor out or anything. If you're bottom fishing and you catch one, you need to have a, a buoy or a jug or something on your boat tied to a line, to your anchor line, that you can just let go of immediately. And, you know, the, the one that I have, it has my name and my boat and all that on it. So if somebody comes along and sees it, you know, and you don't lose your anchor line that way. And a lot of times that's the difference between getting a fish and not. You know, a cobia, when he hits, sight fishing, usually not so much. You're not too much in a current. Usually you're out in the, you know, in the ocean. But bottom fishing, 
they're going to put you in the hardest part of that current that they can to put a strain on you. And that's why I just, I let that anchor line go immediately as soon as I know it's a cobia. And the one way to really know that it's a cobia is everybody's seen the people fishing for them and they're bent over the side of the boat and nothing's really moving. It's just, it's solid. That's usually a big stingray. Even if you got a shark, it's going to, it's going to go out some, but a cobia, all the cobia that I've ever caught come to the top, you know, especially anchored up. They're going to come to the top and they're going to make a circle. They're going to put you into that current as much strain as they can put on you. And they're going to kind of go out and they're going to come back towards the boat. And when they do, they're getting ready to uh, make a dive. A lot of times, if you're uh, if you're good with the gap and all that, you can get them in the boat. So a lot of times, they'll come close enough to the boat where you can gap them and get them in. But that's only been fighting them for about five minutes. Once they make that dive, they're going to go to the bottom to stay down. And, you know, then you got to fight them. But uh, that's why I just, I like to chase them. It's less strain on your gear, on the angler. And you can, a lot of times, work them up into shallow water. You know, get them up towards the shoulder or two, three feet. They can't go down. They got to go out and uh, just wear them down. And I've caught some that I just let them pull the boat. You know, they get a big one like that and uh, can't do anything with them. I just let them pull the boat around a little while. They tire out. You know, another thing good to point out with this as well, Noah, is, uh, you know, be aware of your surroundings again, That whether the other boat's anchored up or other boats trolling around you. Typically, um, whether, you know, people are anchored up in the channels, um, you know, out toward Barden's Inlet, and, you know, there's generally quite a few people around. So just be aware of the surroundings around you, because if you do ho- get hooked up and you're trying to chase the fish, you don't want to get so caught up that you don't see the other boats around you. Um, so that's, that's something that uh, we see quite a bit on the water as well. Yeah, I've, I've been in that situation myself. It's, uh, I mean, it's nerve wracking for the best of anglers and boat handlers. To be honest with you, if you're right in the pack, cobia fishing, bottom fishing, um, usually you're not going to encounter too many people trolling in there, but you're going to be amongst a lot of anchor lines and a lot of cobia lines out. And uh, that's the other thing, you know, you a lot of these cobia hot spots like you know, Cape Lookout right there at the entrance of Barton's Inlet, uh, Beaufort Inlet along that edge coming in is a real good spot. And they get just hammered with boats. So you got to think about that when you're getting ready to anchor somewhere. You know, who's around me? How close? If we hook a fish, what's going to happen? You know, how are we going to move him out of here? Whatever. Sight fishing, you just want to be you want to know where your uh, where your boats that are trolling are. Just kind of keep an eye on them. Most of the time, they're going to steer clear of you. Cause, you know, I do the same thing when I see somebody cubby fishing. I give them a wide berth, and um, just try to be respectful in that manner. Because you know, nobody wants it done to them. Just kind of think about it like that. Yeah. Now, is there anything else that you see that people should be aware of, or or you know? I mean, we definitely covered a you know covered a lot in a short amount of time, but uh, you know, with cobia, is there anything anything else that you see or? Well, if you the one thing I will and people kind of naturally steer away from sight fishing when uh when the when the wind's up, you know, when you're sight fishing, you got to have a real real nice day and um. If you see a, you know, come up and you see some guys casting on a, a bait, a bait ball, menhaden out there, you know, unless they invite you in, give them, there's, there's plenty of bait out there, plenty of places to catch them, you know, give them a, give them a break, you know, let them, let them fish that, you know, like I said, unless they invite you in, I got, you know, I know a lot of people out there, if I'm fishing something and i'm not right on some fish i'll say yeah give it a shot you know but if i get to pull up on a bait ball and i've got three or four fish sitting down there 
that I can see from my tower, you know, I'd, somebody's always going to come in, but just I encourage people to, you know, be polite, be courteous. So that's about it. Well, tell us, tell us, like, let's say these guys just can't get it. They they want to they want to come with a pro. Tell us a little bit of information how they get in touch with you, how they find you. Yeah, you can. Uh, if anybody wants to take a Cobia trip on a charter, and um, you know, all I what I usually do on Cobia charters is I bring my I bring my light tackle gear as well because. Even if you got a picture perfect day for cobia fishing around here, usually by twelve and one o'clock you got a sea breeze blown up, and it's going to be really hard, hard to see in the water, hard to find a bait, and you're going to have to turn to something else. Or a lot of people, you know, maybe they uh, they got kids on the boat, and you know they're getting a little bit antsy because cobia fishing, you know, you got you might go out and catch two right away. Mm-hmm. Or you might pound it all day long up and down the beach. So, and if you got if you got young people on the boat or people that just want to try something else, you know, I just I carry a little bit of everything. You never know when you're, and also when you're Spanish fishing. When I'm Spanish fishing, I always got two Tobia rods on the boat during the season, rigged up just in case. But uh, yeah, you can find me at Noah's Ark Fishing Charters dot com. That's my website. And uh, you can also give me a call at two five two three four two six nine one one. One of the good things is uh, Noah th- will thoroughly thoroughly entertain you on the boat too. We we go out and film with Noah quite a bit and uh, he'll thoroughly entertain you on the boat. Right, Noah? <laughs> it's always going to be a good time. We're going to have a good time no matter what. Yep, I'm going to make sure of that for sure. Well, you know, the good thing is Noah's got a lot of uh, great local knowledge. Um, he's been in the area for a really long time, so he's got a lot of good stories, a lot of good information, a lot of good local knowledge of the area, which um, you know helps a lot when you're out there on the water and people are asking questions and you know wanting to get the full experience. Full experience. Captain Noah Link, uh, he, he's definitely on the water quite a bit, and uh, we always enjoy bringing him on the show as well as going out in the water with him and fishing with him. But uh, I tell you, Noah, it's always a pleasure to have you join us to talk to us about, um, you know, Cobia and Spanish or anything else. But, you know, it's something that we definitely enjoy a bit. And Price was over there taking notes um, so he can come Spanish and Cobia fishing. But uh, but he, he, he may want to call, yeah. call you, though, Noah. Oh gosh! Yeah, I got him. I got him on uh, speed dial. I'll see who it is. Oh my god! Listen, I, 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 I've taken some notes on this one, man. Holy smokes! I, I would. I think I would have to call Noah on that one. I, I'm not that experienced to catch that myself. So, Noah, I'll be calling you soon. All right. Sounds good. Sounds great. Yep. Need to get you guys out on the water. We know we greatly appreciate it, buddy. And as always, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to catching up with you here soon and also seeing you out on the water. Thank you very much. All right, Noah. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to talk with you and Price. All right. Thank you. Price, as always, it's great to have Captain Noah Link from Noah's Ark Fishing Charters up. Uh, you know, it's always it's always funny to have him on the show because we always have such a good time on the boat. And uh, it's difficult sometimes being serious because – He's always have, wanting to have a good time, as do we. And uh, But it's great to get a lot of great technical information from Noah so people can learn, get out there, and fish themselves. That's something that we promote heavily here on Point Click Fish. Yeah, you know, Captain Noah, he's another one of those guys. If you ever have an opportunity that you see his name, that he's uh, presenting at a fishing school or a uh, some sort of uh, presentation, make sure to attend because you want to talk about somebody who really knows this stuff. And I mean, he, as you want, or as, you know, like, you know, the simplicity of it as well and stuff. And Noah's just one of those great guys that knows how to explain it. And he really knows how to catch fish. Well, you know, this show was as a result of a lot of people 
emailing us, messaging us, wanting to know more information about how to catch catch Spanish mackerel themselves and as well how to catch cobia themselves. So as always, we want to make sure we give you the latest and greatest information on how you can educate yourself, get out there and go fishing. So Price, we're going to kick things out. We're going to head into the weekend. Got a great tournament, the Swansboro Rotary Blue Water Tournament this weekend. So we're looking forward to uh, going live uh, this weekend. So check us out, pointclickfish.com. If you miss it and you're listening to the show later, make sure you check out pointclickfish.com. We'll have the live feed on there as well, archived, so you can see all the action. It's a blue marlin tournament that takes place in Moorhead City. That's put on by the Swansboro Rotary. So we have a great time, great event, and they do great things for the community. So, Price, we're going to head on out so we can get things kicked off for the Swansboro show, but make sure that you join us next week as we're releasing everything on YouTube, iTunes, and pointclickfish.com. We hope to see you there soon.